open your Bibles, <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, as you know last week we were at the main conference and we had a great time, and as my custom is, I, if I preach at a conference away from home, I usually don't have my everything set up there like I do here, and I spoke with some people and they, they requested that I did it again here, which I usually do anyway, just because um, I feel more liberty preaching here than I do away where, you know, when I'm away, I, I don't know. It's, it's different when you preach to your own people rather than all new faces. So I'm going to redo that message that I did at, at the conference because I know that there's a lot of people online who wondered what, I, you know, what we preached and things were recorded on MP3. They're going to be on uh, Ed Yarber's site. I don't know when, and so, but I know that I'd rather do this as far as my message went, and uh, so you're in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we'll, we'll begin reading, we'll just read uh, the whole armor of God beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <clears throat> Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication and all, and all in, the, in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all supplication all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, the armor of God, as I've come to understand it and learn it since I've been saved, is of such vital importance for the Christian in the dispensation of grace. I remember when I was first saved, I was saved in January of 1984 in a Pentecostal church in Margate, Florida. And as I look back on that now, and I look at those days, and I realize that there I was without the armor of God, without an understanding of what the armor of God is, in the midst of the wiles of the devil. Smack dab in the midst of it. With no weapon to fight no knowledge of how to understand what was going on around me. And I think about all the people today, all the Christians today who get saved with all of the new versions, the watered-down Bibles, the storytelling preachers, preachers who don't know anything about a Bible themselves, who don't know how to study their Bibles, and I just think of those poor Christians out there who never will have a chance to overcome the wiles of the devil because they're in the midst of them and they don't even know they're in there. <coughs> they don't even know they're in trouble. I submit to you that is a sad state of affairs for the body of Christ today. I remember after eight years of being in the Pentecostal church, and reading my Bible, and being drawn to Paul's epistles, because here was a man who understood my problem, who understood what had happened to me in my salvation, in my redemption, how I was delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, having now this forgiveness, being in Christ. And as I read and read and read, began to see the error of what was being taught. I left the Pentecostal church. I went to the Nazarene, the, the Plymouth Brethren. In the Plymouth Brethren, I met a group of people who were 
dyed in the wool, law-keeping Pharisees who enforced the law upon their people. Yeah, they preached salvation by grace. Yes, they preached the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, they preached salvation was a free gift. They did that. But they didn't understand how to rightly divide their truth from the entire truth of the Word of God and thought they could mix everything and make it apply to you. And so they placed people under the law. Their women have to wear head coverings, according to 1 Corinthians 11. <coughs> and then I left them after six months and went to the Nazarene church. Stayed in the Nazarene church for a year and a half. And, you know, you've heard about the doctrine of entire sanctification, how you can become perfect even in this world, and you'll never sin again. <coughs> they taught that. And then one day I was invited by Rita to a revival in a Baptist church. They had a preacher there for a year. And for the first time, I actually heard a preacher talk about things that I agreed with the eternal salvation of the believer. Tongues weren't for today. And I'm like, wow, that's close. That's a lot closer than anything I had ever been in. So I was moving forward. And then met my wife and moved over to Newington and to her church. And the pastor asked me to begin teaching the adult, well, he asked me to name the class. And I named it the Adult Biblical Doctrines Class. And I taught that for five years in that church. And it was through that church that I really began to see the error of not rightly dividing the word of truth and trying to apply things to us that did not apply. I will share with you in a few moments the very first verse that ever let me know in the Bible that there were things in this book that were not written to me. And it was that was what launched me into an understanding of rightly dividing the word of truth. <coughs> so as we begin today, we'll be talking about the Christian in complete armor and how to stand against the wiles of the devil. You'll notice in Ephesians chapter 6, our main focus will be really verse 11 <coughs> because it tells you to put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 11 is not a suggestion. It is not a request by God. It's not even just a good idea. Put on the whole armor of God is a command to the body of Christ. It is an exhortation from God that will enable you to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil are found in the realm of Christianity. They're not found in Mormon, Mormonism. They're not found in Jehovah's Witnessism. They're not found in the Muslim religion. Those are not the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil are found in Christianity, where he is most interested. You know, it's like I told the story before of how, <coughs> as a very young Christian, I was with three other guys. We had been to a prayer meeting and a Bible study at some friend's house, a friend's house. And then as we were driving back, we passed by a house of ill repute, so to speak, you know, girls, girls, girls was the thing. And one of the guys in the back seat said, boy, I bet there's a lot of demons of lust in there. And when he said that, I said to myself, I said out loud, there are no demons of lust in there. They hang around in churches. They don't need to be there. <laughs> you know. Your flesh doesn't need help with that. You're a fallen child of Adam. 
So this put on, put on the whole armor of God, for the most part, has been completely ignored and neglected and even rejected by the body of Christ at large. Because the whole armor of God, as we find it in Ephesians chapter 6, is doctrinal teaching that enables you to stand against the wiles of the devil. Every piece in the armor of God has a unique and a special doctrine for you as a Christian that lives in the dispensation of grace that will fortify you and establish your understanding and help you to understand God's plan and God's purpose for this dispensation of grace that we live in. <laughs> a common mistake that is made by many preachers, and I've heard this many times since I've been saved, is that they want to materialize the armor of God. I've heard preachers in the past talk about how when you wake up in the morning, you put on the armor piece by piece until you're completely dressed, as though it was something that you could take off and put on at will. That is not what the armor of God is. You cannot materialize the armor of God. It is a spiritual armor that is designed to protect you in a spiritual warfare, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the body of Christ. It's a spiritual warfare. So you cannot put this armor on and off every time or every day or as you will. <coughs> you know, we've all seen a literal physical armor. You know, you've walked into a store at one point on a vacation or something and there was a big old steel armor. You went to Disney World, you saw steel armor. We went to the White Mountains one time, and in the general store up there, in the White Mountains, there's an armor, a guy, the complete armor. That's not what Paul is talking about. The armor of Ephesians chapter 6 is a body of doctrine for the body of Christ, designed by God to equip us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. The armor of, of God <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 6 is literally an overview of the entire body of doctrine that was committed to the Apostle Paul and how you apply it to your life. That's what the armor of God is. It's Romans to Philemon in a nutshell with the application for your life and how with it you can overcome the wiles of the devil. That's what the armor is. And so for uh, just our brief edification this morning, <coughs> you have to forgive me because uh, I got this cough today, which I really can't stand. I've heard preachers who have a cough, and it bugs the living daylights out of me. <laughs> so I can only imagine. Whew. But we'll look at the armor for the purpose of just laying a foundation for understanding the wiles of the devil this morning, okay? We can talk about the wiles of the devil all we want. But unless we understand the armor of God, our talk will be futile and vain and empty will be to no avail and no purpose. So notice Ephesians 6.14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now in the scripture, the loins girt about with truth has to do with being ready. Has to do with being prepared for battle. If you recall... In the Gospels, when Jesus Christ is instructing Israel and he knows that they're going to be going into the tribulation period to face the Antichrist, this is what he says to them in Luke chapter 12. 
Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is where they're going. Here's Jesus Christ speaking to the little flock, those that he has called out of the nation of Israel, who are now following him, and, you know, reprobate Israel is down here. <coughs> now Jesus Christ is instructing them that they're going into the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But he knows that before they go into the kingdom, they're going to be going through a time of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. That they're going through Daniel's 70th week to face the Antichrist. The seven-year tribulation period. And so, as, they're, as he's instructing them to go into that kingdom, notice he says in verse 33, sell that ye have. Give alms, provide for, your, <coughs> provide for yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. In other words, let your loins be girded about. Let your lights be burning. Be ready. Be ready. Like he said in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Of course, he's referring to this, the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation period. So he knows where they're going, but he knows what they're going to go through to get there. And they're going through a time, a time of trouble like no one has ever experienced before in the world until then. So there are, in, in Scripture, you know how there's the cross according to prophecy where Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David, he's raised from the dead to sit on the throne of David. And then there's the cross according to the revelation of the mystery, where he was raised from the dead for our justification. Right? So there's, there are different concepts in the word of God, according to prophecy and according to the revelation of the mystery. The doctrine of having your loins girt about with truth according to prophecy, because that's where he's talking about, he's pointing to prophecy, their loins girded about with truth means you're girding your loins because you're going into a literal, visible, physical war against the Antichrist. That's your loins girded about with truth according to prophecy. But then you have your loins girded about with truth according to the revelation of the mystery. Ours is not a physical warfare. It is a spiritual warfare. Notice verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, let me ask you this. <coughs> is there something that a Christian can put on his loins that will gird him about with truth? Not physically. No, there isn't. Okay. So what does Paul mean? Have your loins girt about with truth. <coughs> I'm sorry, boy. You want to finish preaching this? No? Okay. So what does Paul mean, have your loins girt about with truth? The only way we can know is to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. It's the only way we can know. The Bible is its own translator, has its own built-in dictionary. And so we find in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Obviously, we know Peter is writing to those people who are going through Daniel's 70th week. He says, Lloyd up the girds of your mind. That's a transdispensational truth. <coughs> See, when Paul says, gird up the loins of your, gird up your loins with truth, what he means is you gird up 
the loins of your mind with truth. In verse 14, truth obviously is referring to the word of God. But what's the difference with verse 14 and verse 17? Notice verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In verse 14, it's the word of God. The truth is the word of God. That's the only place truth can be found. In verse 17 is the word of God. They're both the word of God. What's the difference? The difference is that in verse 14, the truth is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In other words, the truth Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 14, <coughs> 6, 14, is the truth of Genesis to Revelation. It's all truth, but it's not all your truth. There's truth that belongs to the, Israel under the law, truth that belongs to Israel when Jesus Christ came as the minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises <coughs> that were made unto the fathers. Then there's truth after the cross. Then Romans 11, 11, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Then there's truth that belongs to the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace after the fall of Israel. Then the body of Christ will be caught out of here. And then there's truth that belongs to the body of Christ after the rapture of the church as they go back into Daniel's 70th week. So you've got Hebrews to Revelation, ages to come. Romans to Philemon, but now, and Genesis all the way to Acts chapter 9, upon the or Acts 7, and then Paul being saved in Acts 9 as time passed. So it's all truth, but it's not all your truth. You have to rightly divide their truth from our truth and our truth from their truth. That's how you rightly divide the word of truth. So in Ephesians 6.14, when Paul says, have your loins girt about with truth, he means the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. From Genesis to Revelation, you must have a working knowledge in your mind, in your understanding of that entire body of doctrine. You gird up the loins of your mind by understanding what belongs to you and what does not belong to you. It's all truth. But it's not all your truth. It's the truth rightly divided. That's what Paul is talking about in verse 14. Having your loins girt with all truth. And the most important part about this truth is that you know what's your truth and what is not your truth. But then in verse 17, that's also the word of truth. That's also the word of God. <laughs> but you'll notice in verse 17 that the word of God becomes an offensive weapon. In verse 14, you have, you have your loins girt. In verse 17, you take, you take the helmet of salvation and you take the sword of the spirit. You take the sword of the spirit. And it becomes an offensive weapon for you. You see, in verse 14, you have it. It is a present possession of yours. It is based on your study of the whole scripture. See that? You have it. But in verse 17, you take something that you have, and then you use it. You use the word of God to defend yourself against the wiles of the devil. Especially when he comes to you against his ministers, who do not have the loins of their mind girt about with truth and who don't rightly divide the word of truth. <coughs> For example, when a, when a popular preacher of the day who is speaking to the body of Christ, all right, he's speaking to the body of Christ. And he says, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. 
And he says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And now he's added works to the salvation that last week he said was free. You take out the sword of the Spirit, or because you have the sword of the, of the Spirit in your understanding, you know, you say to yourself, no, that's not right. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to his mercy that he saved us. That's not right because I know, therefore, being justified by faith, I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. So I know that's not right because Titus 3, 5 said, not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me. See? You can use the sword of the Spirit only if the loins of your mind have been girt about with truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the Word of God rightly divided. And when you have that, it means you're ready to stand and protect and defend yourself from the wiles of the devil. <coughs> Notice in verse... Uh, In verse 14, well, I don't think I got the right thing down there, but in verse 14, you got your Bibles open, right? He says, have on the breastplate of righteousness. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having, having on the breastplate of righteousness. This, again, it's something you have. Well, what is it? Well, first of all, it's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. You know, when, when that popular preacher stands up, says, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and says, accept your righteousness. Exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. You shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, because the loins of your mind are girt about with truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth of the Word of God rightly divided, you say, that's not true. My entrance into heaven is not based upon my righteousness. It's based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not based upon my works. You remember Abraham. Abraham's called the father of the faith. Well, what did he do to become the father of the faith? You remember Romans chapter 4, right? What did he do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's what he did. And when was this righteousness imputed unto him? Before he circumcised Isaac or after he circumcised Isaac? Before he circumcised, before he ever did anything, he... God's righteousness was imputed unto him. The point being that Abraham did nothing but believe. All he did was he believed and he was persuaded that what God had promised, God would, would fulfill. So righteousness was imputed to him because of his faith, not because of his works. That's why when Paul gets to Romans chapter 5, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Therefore, based upon what we learn about Abraham, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham is called the father of all who believe. How, how is he as a father? How, how is he an example as the father of all who believe? He's an example because he did nothing. <laughs> That's how he's your example. That's how he's your father. Because he showed you as your father, he was your example, and showed you that you're saved by doing nothing. Imagine if you had to do something to be saved. Would you ever believe you did enough, that you did it right, that God was satisfied with your work? Could you imagine if you were, had any part in it, any hand in it? You've ruined everything else you've touched. What are you going to do in your salvation?
Okay? And then, you know, this salvation, according to Romans 5.1, <coughs> being armed with this is also very important, that it's therefore being justified. And justification is a two-sided coin. On one side of the coin, you're forgiven. You're forgiven of everything you've ever done. <laughs> that's unbelievable. I mean, if that's all you got in justification, that would be more than enough. That you were forgiven. And you never had to worry about suffering the vengeance of God's eternal wrath. That would be amazing. But that's not all. There's another side to that coin. God didn't just forgive you. He then looked at you and said, I declare you righteous. I declare you righteous in my son. Of course, that didn't make a change in you. You didn't change. Well, you're, you're changing. But that did not make a change in you to where you became righteous and started acting righteous. <coughs> There's a learning curve in the Christian life. Of course, you know that didn't make a change in you already. You already know that. But the righteousness that you have now doesn't belong to you. It belongs to another. And he gave it to you. That's justification. That's why you could never have had your hand in salvation. You could have never contributed to your salvation. There was nothing you could give. <laughs> nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I, pray, I, I cling. But, but it's a declaration, and it always fascinates me that it's a declaration God made when your status changed from being in Adam to being in Christ. Something God gave you as part of the gift. Not only is it the gift of eternal life, it's the gift of righteousness. His righteousness imputed to your account. That is the breastplate of righteousness. That's what you're armed with in this fight against the wiles of the devil that are out there <coughs> that are out there trying to persuade people that they have to earn their way to heaven. You are armed with the girdle of truth, and in that girdle of truth is all truth, which includes the truth of the breastplate of righteousness linked together. You're complete in Christ. That's what the breastplate of righteousness tells you. Not I, but Christ. Paul goes on in verse 15. There it is. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When that preacher stands in that pulpit and he preaches to the body of Christ, and he preaches the gospel of the kingdom and says that signs, wonders, and diverse miracles of the Holy Ghost follow him. Because you have the armor of God and you have, on, and you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you can take out the sword of the Spirit and say, no, that's not true. We walk by faith, not by sight. And the gospel that we preach is not the gospel of the kingdom. It's the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which brings peace to the heart and to the mind and to the conscience of all those who believe. That's what Paul said, Ephesians chapter 2, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them which were nigh. It's the gospel of peace. And it brings peace between God and men. That's the gospel of our reconciliation. Where all men can be at peace with God. Simply by doing nothing. Well nothing except believe. And according to Ephesians 1.13. It's believe and trust. The gospel of your salvation 
in whom also after that ye believed, ye trusted. In both of those things, believing and trust, you do nothing. You are not actively doing anything. You're just resting like in a hammock. You're believing the hammock is just going to keep you there and keep you comfy. And you're trusting that you're not going to fall to the ground. But you're not doing anything. You just believe and trust. That's salvation today. <coughs> That's salvation. For thousands of years, God left. Men, God made men responsible for performance. Perform, 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 and they failed and failed and failed and failed to the point where they killed his son. That's how much of a bunch of failures men were. And so when God cut off Israel's program, postponed their program, saved Saul of Tarsus, and he said, now I'm going to give you a message that takes salvation out of the hands, the hands of men, takes the responsibility away from them, and puts it exclusively upon me. I'll be responsible for this salvation. You know what they'll have to do? Nothing. Nothing, Paul. That way, there's no chance they can mess it up. All I did was believe <coughs> that Jesus Christ died for me and that his blood was sufficient to forgive me of my sins. Just me and you if you believed. But me personally. The only thing I brought to my salvation was the sin that made it necessary. And that's all you brought to your salvation too. And you brought plenty of it. You did a good job with that. You know what I mean? We all did a good job with that. But after I brought my sin, and after I believed, and after the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me, that's the only part I had in my salvation. After that second happened, when I trusted and I believed, Jesus Christ himself took a hold and said, okay, the rest of the journey is on me. I'll finish the journey for you. It's my faithfulness to the Father in perfectly performing his will and doing everything he ever asked me to do without failure that will finish this journey for you. It's my faith and my faithfulness. The faith of Christ, I preached three messages on the faith of Christ. You should go revisit those. Notice he continues in verse 17. Uh, I, got, I think I'm a little confused with my PowerPoint this morning, but oh well. I don't think I'm moving. To, oh yeah. Yeah, verse... Verse 17, anyway, says, take the helmet of salvation, okay? Take the helmet of salvation. And in order to understand that, we have to compare Scripture with Scripture. That's the Scripture we compare it with. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. What does the hope of salvation mean? protect you from it protects you from the preacher who stands in the pulpit and says you can lose your salvation that's what it protects you from it protects you from the guy who stands in the pulpit says open to Matthew 7 21 it says not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven it protects you from the preacher who says for if ye forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
and they put that law upon men today and make that the standard for their forgiveness. The Gospels are filled with warnings like this for those people who are going into the tribulation period, like Hebrews 10.26. He, right, he says that right here. If you sin willfully, after that you, after that you receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, <coughs> but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and unholy. He's talking to these people right here in the tribulation period. Yeah, wrath is coming. Judgment is coming. That's who he's talking to. How different is that from what we learn from our apostle? Romans 5.1 again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 1.2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God that cannot lie promised eternal life. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Those verses, they let you know, they give you hope. Romans 8.38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor thing present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's the helmet of salvation. Put on for a helmet the hope of salvation. Romans 5, 2, Paul talked about having access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. He tells you you're standing right smack dab in the middle of the grace of God. Like the hub of the wheel. No matter where the wheel moves, the hub is always in the middle. The hub can never be outside of the middle of a wheel. No matter if you go up a wall, up, wherever you go. Paul says you're standing right smack dab in the middle of the grace of God. Put on for a helmet the hope of salvation. Your hope is based upon the grace of God that you're standing in. That's what you have in Christ. When that preacher stands in that pulpit and he tells you you can lose your salvation, you, you absolutely know because you know the truth. You know the truth of what you have in Christ. So the armor of God gives you a working knowledge of the entire body of doctrine that was committed to the Apostle Paul for your edification. What does it protect you against? Oh, let me rephrase that. Who does it protect you again? It protects you from these guys. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. You ever think about that verse, this one? Whose end shall be according to their works. Notice it does not say, whose end shall be destruction. It, whose end shall be according to their works. Where will their works be judged? The judgment seat of Christ. That's what we read, 1 Corinthians 3.13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Some of these guys are saved. Some of these guys are saved, and they're, they're outright deceivers. That's what you were before you rightly divided the word of truth. They handled the word of God deceitfully. That makes them false workers. But they've trusted Jesus Christ to save them. And he cannot deny himself. He can never deny himself. These men occupy the pulpits of America and of the world. 
Three times in Paul's epistles. Three times. Paul says, If ye do such things, ye shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In Ephesians 5, he says, Or the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of Christ, and of God. Notice that it does not say, They shall not enter into the kingdom of God. It doesn't say that. <coughs> it says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You can live in England. Doesn't mean you're inheriting the kingdom. That's set aside for a select few. They, in, they are in the kingdom. They're part of the kingdom. They reign in that kingdom. Not everybody in England reigns. Not everybody who enters into the kingdom of God has the same or occupies the same position. Some of these men, these false teachers, will be shocked when they see people, itsy bitsy little Christians in their eyes, who left their churches to join that itsy bitsy little group that does what? They rightly divide what? They rightly divide the word of truth? Well, I do that too, you know. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. How will you recognize them? In 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul talks about giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. <coughs> what does he mean, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Well, first of all, seducing spirits are not spirits that make you lust. Fallen man doesn't need help with that. I'll say it again today. It's the second time I say it. Fallen man doesn't need help with that. He's born towards that. Seducing spirits. Seducing means it sounds so good, you can't resist it. You're going to prosper. Everything's going to turn out good for you. All your bills will be paid. The thousands of them flock. To those churches to hear that those lies the last thing God ever promised you is a primrose path of prosperity that's the last thing he ever promised you okay but thousands get deceived by that seducing the Pied Piper bellowing out his promises, the Joels of the world, the Joels of the pulpits. They think that because all those people are there listening to them, that they're going to walk into the, the pearly gates. That's what they think they're going, the pearly gates, and everybody's going to be applauding them. Oh, here's Joel. That's what he thinks. But you're going to sit there and watch all his works burn. And what did he have left? That he trusted Jesus Christ one day. And thank God he's going in. Thank God he's going in. Yet he himself shall be saved. But that's it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. But he's not getting what he thinks he's getting. He pictures himself up there with this, you know, even bigger crowd. Because he figures that's what he earned on earth. And then there's doctrines of devils. The doctrines of devils are not doctrines about Satan worship or anything like that. 
their doctrines from those who claim to be preachers of the gospel. They preach what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 when he talks about the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. They're doctrines that devil, devils teach through preachers. That's what doctrines of devils are. What did the devil teach? Remember when Jesus Christ was led of the devil, was led of the spirit to be tempted of the devil? <coughs> 40 days, 40 nights. There were three temptations. Two of those temptations, the devil requested Jesus Christ to perform a miracle. The first one was turn this stone into bread. The second one was jump off the temple and he'll give his angels charge over you. They'll protect you. Both of those were designed to try to make Jesus Christ act prematurely outside of the dispensational setting that he was in at that time. It wasn't time for him to be performing miracles then. And he wanted him to act outside of the dispensational timeline that God had. God has a timeline. <coughs> God has always had a timeline. So he wanted him to do something that wasn't time. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here's John chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus, this is the, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. Where she asked him to turn water into wine. And he said to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus Christ recognized. He knew there's a time, there's an hour. <coughs> and then being the mother that she is, when he said that, she looked at those around and said, whatever he says, do it. So he turned the water into wine because his hour started there to demonstrate who he was to the world. Notice in John 7, verse 8, go ye up unto this feast, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. I go not up yet unto this feast. Notice, for my time is not yet full come. John 8, 20, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, <coughs> having, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And then John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes and said, Father, the hour is come. There is a timeline in your Bible for everything God does. The most incredible dispensational verse in your Bible, the most incredible one, where do you think it's found? 2 Timothy 2.15? Anybody else? Romans 16.25 is good. Anybody else? Both wrong, but they're good. No, they're good. They're good verses. The most incredible dispensational verse in the entire King James Bible is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the sun. Huh? Under heaven, yeah, under heaven. Under heaven. Huh? <laughs> under the heaven. Under the heaven. Okay? That is the most incredible dispensational verse in your Bible. That is 
the heart of Almighty God. That is his heart right there. You see what I'm saying? And these preachers today, in perfect keeping with the master of deception, try to lure their followers to obey and perform under a dispensation that they no longer live in. So they stand over here, and they bring you over here. And they stand over here, and they bring you over here and put you under these laws and condemnation and judgments for the purpose of manipulating you through fear so they can get you to support their ministries and do what they want you to do. And that is the motive behind. But when you're armed, when you have on the full armor of God and the loins of your mind are girt about with truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, rightly divided, you having done all to stand, stand. You can stand and not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And they do. You've seen me do this before. I did it in Maine. I'll do it right now just to finish this thing off. But silver in your King James Bible represents redemption. And in the dispensation of grace, there's only one, one gospel. There's only one place to find redemption. But the preachers today will take this salvation and they'll tell you that it's in the book of Hebrews. But there's nothing for you there. Redemption is here in the dispensation of grace. Or they will take this redemption and try to bring it over here in the past where there's nothing for you. Your redemption is here in the dispensation of grace. There's one gospel. There's one preacher preaching this gospel, and it's Paul. And we preach his gospel. Amen? This is where your redemption is. This is where the silver in the word of God is found. Right here. Nowhere else. But preachers today, they take their followers and bring them here. There's nothing here. I mean, this is for our edification. It's for our learning. It's having the loins of our mind girt about with truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But this is where you are. This is your truth. And you rightly divide your truth from their truth and your truth from their truth. Amen? <coughs> I feel bad, like I started this message with, I feel bad for people today who get saved in these churches where they don't even know or they think that the King James Bible is some archaic book that should be on the dusty shelf of some museum somewhere. And those preachers are up there telling stories. They don't have them open their Bibles. They don't even bring Bibles to church anymore. Some of these big emergent churches. They, they emerged out of Christianity. And now they're, we've emerged and we're trying to make it so everybody can come here and enjoy themselves. The church is the ground and pillar of the truth where you come to get equipped to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's what this is for. Nothing else. That's why we have a couple songs that we get into the important thing and get into the word of God. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this time that we could spend in the word of God. I pray that <coughs> these words and this truth will be forged upon the tablets of our hearts. Pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.